So in this video, we're just gonna take a look at a really basic ARM application, just to get a really good fundamental feel of the structure of our programs, as well as the way that they actually run. So we're gonna go over a lot of the important concepts of you know, where the starting point of our application is, where the ending point of our application is, and um, how can we do all of the things in between. So starting off with this idea, let's discuss the starting point of our program. You'll see that our emulator automatically puts in two lines for us. Now, if you're programming outside of the emulator, you won't have these two lines added by default. You have to add them yourself. Um, but they are essential because they tell us the starting point of our application. So let me break down the lines one by one here. I'm going to start backwards with this underscore start portion here. This is known as a label. A label is sort of synonymous with a function in higher level languages. It's a way of being able to divide out segments of code such that if you go to the label, you start to execute the code that is underneath that label. The idea of this is that we set up a start label, which then we are able to say, okay, go to the start and start running the stuff that's there. That's the idea of what we're looking to do. So that's why we define our start label. And then our global underscore start here is a way of being able to tell people about the start label. So someone is going to be running our program. So at some point, something is going to be running our program. It needs to know where the starting point is as well. When we define labels by default, they aren't available to anything external to our program. The dot global is telling everyone else about our start label. So if anyone ever approaches our program and says, I want to run you, where is the start? The start is exported via this global, which means that everything is able to see where the starting point is. Therefore, things are able to go to the starting point to start executing our program. So this is the general idea of sort of like our main starting point of our application. So everything that we write is going to be underneath this start label. So that's where we're going to start writing our code. And the code that I'm going to write is going to be very, very simple. All it's going to do is it's going to move some data into register zero. That way you can see how we move data into registers. And then I'm going to move some data into register seven. It might seem a little bit weird that I'm jumping straight to register seven. The reason being is because register seven is a special purpose register. What it does is it stores information about system calls. When we go to the operating system, we often want to ask it to do specific things for us, right? The operating system manages input, it manages output, it manages um, the execution of programs. So if we need the operating system to do something for us, we need some method of communicating with it. This method of communication comes in two pieces. The first is in system interrupts, and the second is in um, system call numbers. So we place a special number into register seven, and that tells the operating system what we would like it to do. So basically we place the number into R7 and then we call an interrupt. That interrupt goes to the operating system and it says, hey, we need something done. The operating system comes in and it reads register seven, which has some number inside of it. It takes that number and it compares it to like a lookup table and it says, okay, well that number corresponds with this task. And then it completes that task for us. In our case, our task is very simple. We want our program to end. So if I want to terminate the execution of my program, what I do is I move the number one into R7, and then I call an interrupt. The operating system then goes to register seven. It says, oh, I see the number one here. It goes to its little table, and its table says one corresponds to exit the program, and then it terminates the program for us. So that shows us how we end our program. So let's take a look at how that's actually written. So the first thing I want to do is move some data into R0. That way we can see um, just generally how we can move data into registers and what that looks like during execution. So the way that we do this is as follows. We're going to start by writing in what's called an opcode. Well, you'll see it set in a number of different ways, either opcode, operation, uh, mnemonic is also used. I'm going to refer to them as operations or opcodes. So we're going to start by writing in the operation that corresponds to moving data, and that is MOV. Now, I use capital letters for mine. You don't have to do that. You can write it in lowercase as well. Um, I just prefer this convention, and this is the one that I'm most, um, most comfortable with. So this is the way that I usually end up writing it. So the way that our move operation actually works is it moves data into um, locations, right? 
Specifically, we're going to move data into registers. So what we need to do is we need to provide it with two things. We need to give it a destination for our data as well as a source for our data. So the source is where we're getting the data from. The destination is where the data is ending up. The destination is the first argument given to this operation, and then the source is the second argument. So my destination in this case, where I want to store the data is R0. Again, I put a capital R. You don't have to. You can use a lowercase r. Um, it's not actually case sensitive. Uh, I just prefer the convention for capital letters, so that's what you'll see me use. So I'm going to move into R0, the value, so I put a comma, and now I'm going to specify the source. So my source could be a number of different things, and we're going to go through these different things um, as we continue learning about assembly, because we can, we can move data from registers, we can move data from memory, so we can do all sorts of things like that. Um, in this case, I'm going to be moving a constant value into this register. So the way that we do this is we put in a hashtag, and then we put in the value that we want to move in. I want to move in the number 30 in decimal. So I just put hashtag 30. All this does is it takes the number 30, it places it into register 0. And that's it. That's how we move the data into the register. Now, one thing I want to point out to you is that you can put hex into these registers as well. The way that you do that is you put 0x and then the hex value that you want to put in. So like for instance, 0x, um, 0a, we'd write the value 0a into register 0. So I just want to point out that that's the way that you do hex. Um, in this case, I'm working in decimal, and I'm pretty much always going to be working in decimal unless I have a very specific reason to be using hex, um, just because I'm, I'm most comfortable with decimal. So that's what you'll see me using throughout this. So I move 30 into register 0. And now we're going to do our portion that ends the program. So remember, I said that I wanted to move into register 7, the value 1, because 1 indicates that we're going to exit our program. And then I want to do a, an interrupt. The way I do this is as follows. I say SWI 0. SWI is a software interrupt. What it does is it interrupts the program, and it lets the operating system take over. Like I said before, the operating system then reads the value in R7. That value is 1. It takes the 1, it checks the lookup table, it says, OK, well, 1 says that we should um, terminate the program, and so we're done. So that's really all there is to that. So nice, straightforward, simple. Let's go ahead and compile and run this. So I'm going to click on Compile and Load. And as you can see, it compiles our program together. And we are now in our disassembly tab. And we can see each of the instructions as it interprets them. Now I will note to you that this emulator doesn't really do well with SWI. It doesn't really understand software interrupts all too well. Um, I'm writing this as if you were writing it for an actual ARM processor. If you're writing this on say like a Raspberry Pi that runs on ARM, SWI is going to be what you're going to use. Um, but our emulator won't end up like executing it properly. So that's just a note, just a little quirk of the emulator, unfortunately. But um, if you're running on an actual ARM processor, this is what you would end up using. So that's why I'm teaching that instead of um, something more specific to this emulator. So let, let's walk through these operations. So remember, the first thing is moving 30 into R0. If I press step into, it will execute that instruction. Now I want to point out a few important things. The first important thing is you can see that R0 now has the value 1e inside of it, which I will tell you is the same as 30 in decimal. If you wanted to verify that, you can actually come down to the settings here. Under format, you can go to decimal unsigned or decimal signed. Um, decimal signed assumes that there's negative numbers. Decimal unsigned assumes that everything is positive. So we can go decimal unsigned since everything is positive. You can see that that gives us a value of 30. So you can see that's how we convert between like the hex and the um, and the actual decimal value. So that's that's something uh, that we're able to do. Now, one additional thing that I want to mention is you can see that we stored one e inside of here. Um, if you're familiar with converting hex to binary, you'll know how to read the binary for this. And you can see that in general, the most significant bit is on the leftmost side. We actually refer to this as a specific type of storage known as Little Indian. So little Indian refers to the most significant bit being on the left-hand side. That's the way that ARM functions as well as many other processors. But an interesting thing about ARM is that actually can be used um, the opposite way as well. So the most significant bit on the right-hand side, which is known as big Indian. We would say that ARM is actually a bi-Indian processor because we can change where the most significant bit is depending on what we're doing. 
So that's just something that I wanted to note about like how things are actually being stored in those registers. Then the last thing that I want to point out here is the idea of the program counter. So the program counter is telling us where we're currently located in terms of instructions. You can see right now it's equal to four. And at address four, we have our move for one into R7. So I just wanted to, you know, pull some attention towards how the program counter was using. That way you can get a bit more context compared to the last video where I just told you what it was doing. Um, now you can actually see it in action. So you can see in our next instruction, we step into R7 gets a value of one, and then we would end up doing a system interrupt and that would end our program. And that's really all there is to it. This is a really basic assembly program that we've now written. So you've now gotten the basic fundamentals of writing a program and what the actual architecture is generally looking like. In the next few videos that I that I put up, I'm going to discuss a little bit about um, the different uh, addressing modes that we have available to us, the different ways that we can move data to and from registers, as well as storing in the stack memory. So we'll, we'll discuss a lot more about memory storage, and then from there we can start to take a look at some um, some more advanced operations, and then some actual like algorithms in building some interesting stuff with our processor.